leave your brochure at home, send it later, spend your time listening to your clients and to your potential clients, and then modify what you send them based on what you hear. Don't bring something already pre-prepared with the assumption that you're going to sell them. Episode 136. This is The Business of Architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Today is the second part of my interview with Karen Compton. She's the principal of A3K Consulting. She's a business strategist and coach for the AEC industry who's been the Director of Business Development and Director of Marketing for small companies, mid-sized, multi-office firms, and international corporations. She focuses on helping firms with under 50 employees increase revenues and market share by taking a strategic focus. Okay. Well, what you're talking about now seems to tie in very well with the business development, which is, of course, the, the second bucket here. (laughs) <laughs> the bucket no one likes. The bucket no one likes. Yeah, I know. So what's up with that? Why don't why don't we like that? I mean, you mentioned rejection. I think you really hit on something there that um I mean, from my early days in architecture school, I felt you know, rejection was hard to take. Yeah. You know? How do we deal with that? How do we shift our mindset? So, it, this is kind of an interesting question because I I jokingly tell people my architects have rejection issues. My, my engineers will do what I ask them to do, but I have to give it to them as tasks. If, if I give them a list and say, these are the 10 things I want you to do, an engineer is going to want to do the task. That's just the nature of how they're wired. They're want, going to want to come back to me and say, look, I did all 10 things. And now I'm going to go and do my calculation until you give me another 10 things. Architects they will do what you ask them to do, but only up until the point they hear no. As soon as they hear no, they take it personally. It becomes internalized in terms of, well, you don't like me. And it's really not about you. And it's not even really about the work. It's about what you do or how you do it doesn't necessarily fit what I need right now. And I think the operative phrase is right now. You have to be open to the point that times change, people change, ideas change. And because no was no today doesn't mean that no will be no forever. But that's a really, really hard shift. So what I try and do, particularly with my architect clients, is put them in a box where they can be comfortable. I don't ask them to cold call. The worst thing you can ever ask an architect to do is to cold call. Because the moment somebody says no, they're going to hang up the phone and say, that's it. I've got billable work to do. I don't need to do this. So what you need to do is give them business development responsibilities that are within their realm of comfort. Have them talk to their existing clients about additional service opportunities. Have them talk to existing clients about trends or problems that the clients are currently encountering and how you might be able to help. That's not within the, the outside the box of yes or no. That's clearly within the realm of comfort. No, one, no one's going to say, well, no, I'm not having problems. Yes, you are. We, we all have them. The, the only difference is the degree to which you choose to share. But within that, what I consider comfortable space, project architects, project architect to project architect, project manager to project manager, you know, what kinds of opportunities are coming up that you think might fit with our firm or fit with the kind of work that we do? That's a safe space. The moment you pick that up and take them to the point of having to develop new work with different clients, people that they don't know, that's where you get into rejection issues. 
How do you coach someone into that process? Uh, first of all, is it necessary that they learn that skill? Can they just rely on the, the comfortable parts that we talked about? You know, if you have a very strong business and a very strong business model, in a perfect world, I would love to see you do 60 to 70% repeat business. I would love that. And the reason why is it's, it's very mathematical. The cost of doing repeat business is $1 in comparison to the cost of developing new business, which is 11. So on a one to 11 ratio, it's so much more cost effective for clients, particularly firms that have less than 50 people to keep the clients that they have happy and satisfied and developing new work within that sphere their cost of marketing and business development dollar goes down, their return on investment goes up. It's a safe space. And as long as they're continuing to deliver well, it will happen. But that's why we choose to focus on practice. Because if it doesn't work to the point where the quality of work isn't being delivered, it's not well coordinated, the communication or collaboration is failing, now we have to look outside of our sphere of repeat business sometimes because the well has run dry. I mean, after all, you can only do so much work with the same client if, if they don't have a continuing stream of work. And that's when we begin to have to look outside. But I would really love firms to focus on the current clients that they have and trying to improve their, their processes and their efficiency to keep them because it does reduce their marketing cost. And when you're, so when you're working with someone who does, okay, we've decided it is time to go out there and there is some additional business development that needs to happen. What does that process look like? After the crying? Yeah, after the you crying. After they stop crying? Okay. <laughs> um, and the denial? Um, the best place to start, if you, if you must, um, honestly, is to, to put people within the framework of conferences. Again, cold calling, I'm going to take off the table and push out as far as I can. If I can assume that um, my clients have a specialty or a case study in something that they have recently done, whether it's designing a new school, whether it's the use of sustainable materials, I would rather put you into the space and place of responding to a calls for papers and doing a presentation than shoving you out and making cold calls. And here's the reason why. In that very comfortable space, architects are very good at instructing others on what they learned, what worked, what didn't work. Within that model, what you basically end up doing is demonstrating to your potential client that you're actually a leader in that particular area called subject matter expertise. I'm sure you've heard this on, and even talked about it on some of your previous podcasts. In that space, you basically have a captive audience of individuals who are interested in the topic or topics which you are actually presenting on, whether that's vis-a-vis -vis webinar or podcast or conference presentation. That's a captive audience of individuals who now see you as having a piece of knowledge or expertise that they didn't previously have. And so within that space, I'm more inclined to say, okay, it's now time for us to shift from our repeat business. Let's look at conferences that fit within the context of where we focus and see if there aren't opportunities for us to present white papers or abstracts or case studies, because that's going to be your highest return on investment. All right. So I'm going to go present to the AIA conference. No, <laughs> no. Okay. Rule number one. Let's make a distinction between peer-to-peer -peer and business-to-business. -business. I love the AIA. I, I have presented at National. I have presented for California. I love them both. But keep in mind, those are your peers, not necessarily your clients. In some cases, they are, but not necessarily so. So if you're going to go to the AIA, understand you're just educating someone else, maybe an employee that you would like to, to recruit. Oftentimes you're educating your competition. That's your decision. However, if you're going to do what I'm suggesting, you need to go where your clients go. 
your clients go business to business. So those conferences are going to be things that tend to focus on the building type or the industry type, transit, higher education, K through 12 education, public works. Those are the kinds of conferences to focus on for a business to business relationship. The AIA or ACEC, while I, like I said, while I do love them and while you do have opportunities to go business to business, the vast majority of participants are peer to peer. So when, when you find that clients do this and they get out there at these conferences, do you find that they, is that all they have to do? Does the phone start ringing or are there other steps involved? Oh, no. I, there's a whole lot of other steps that are involved. I think I think the, the presentation and the discussion is really just the beginning of it. I think it's important to understand that there still has to be follow-up. Every conference I've ever presented at, there's usually a QA session that happens at the end. You always collect cards. I think where some of the largest failures happened is that people take the cards and say thank you and they don't necessarily do anything to actually engage after that. There should always be some kind of post-mortem follow-up. Is there anything I can do for you? Do you have any questions? Um, are there opportunities that you think would be consistent with what we have presented that you feel our firm could respond to? The follow-up becomes an amazing and important part of the engagement that usually kind of just results in a stack of cards on the end of one's desk once you get back from being at a conference for three or four days. So th there's a little bit of discipline that's actually required in order to get that to happen. So I got a business card, you know, so I'm just going to say I like, got a business card because I presented. What What is a way to follow up? How can an architect do that without feeling, like you said, like they're begging for work or feeling like they're they're being salesy or annoying? Okay. So first of all, I'm a huge fan of email. And I know a lot of people get a lot of email. But for people who are very tongue-tied, who are not very good communicators, um, and, and we have a number of them in, the, in this business. They get a little bit nervous, a little bit tongue-tied. They're not the best oral communicators. Sometimes email is the best first step. You know, take the cards, email people and say, hey, thank you so much for coming to my presentation. I would welcome the opportunity to speak with you further on whatever it is that you presented. Do you have any questions? I would like to offer, you know, offer an opportunity to speak to you or meet with you. An email is usually a good first step. If you get a response back, awesome. You can now maybe take the ginger step of picking up the phone and making a phone call because now you know it's not a completely cold call. That individual knows you within the context of what you presented. You're not trying to sell something. You're not trying to push something. What you really want to know, and I, I say this all the time, what you really want to know is what keeps you awake at night? What are your problems, your issues, your concerns? On a first meeting, I, I always tell my clients, do not take your brochure. They don't care. You are there to learn about them. We'll, we'll hear about you later at, at another time. Right now, it's about me as the client. In that space, don't sell. Listen, sit, listen, ask questions. What is your core business? What are the challenges of it? What are your legislative issues? What are your policy issues? What are your staffing constraints, your finance constraints? Because all of those things actually go into the back end of how you should approach a project solution. Most of us tend to focus on the project. We don't really tend to understand the industry in which the project sits. If we take the time to understand that, we come up with very different solutions. Can you give me an example of that, Karen? Absolutely. So <clears throat> I sit on the board of trustees for a K through 12 school, and I also sit on the board of regents for a university. And one of our biggest issues, um, it, well, one of many, I should say, uh, is the ability to raise money and the ability to kind of work within very constrained, I mean, physically constrained geographic borders. Um, both of our campuses are in the middle of 
residential neighborhoods. The campuses were there first, but kind of the town grew up around the gown. And so people are always anxious to come in and present and talk about how wonderfully they're going to make the building look and function, but they dismiss the other issues that are related to the successful design of the building. What is our interaction with our neighbors? How are we going to raise the money in order to complete the building? Are you going to be able to help us raise the money? What kind of visual images can you provide to us to support that effort? Those kinds of questions and answers aren't necessarily in the forethought of individuals' minds um, at the time that they're looking at a project. They're looking at the project and its constraints. They're not necessarily looking at the, the context in which all of that has to sit. Within a college and university environment, our lives are very complicated. Um, oftentimes, WASC accreditation, the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, I'm on the West, um, impacts a lot of what we do. But unless or until people understand that, then the project tends to kind of float by itself without any tie to all of the bigger business issues. So my, my first caveat to anyone is know your client's core business. That's what you're there to find out about. The projects will come, but know their business first, whether that business is education, whether that's sports and recreation, whether that's you know the delivery of public service, understand the business first. Your project fits in the business, not the other way around. It's funny how it all comes back to business, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Karen, I know I know you've been you've been a huge advocate of never eating alone in terms of networking, getting out there. Tell me about your philosophy on that. Well, personally, I don't eat alone, and I also have I also will have uh, coffee with anybody. So I'm always caffeinated. I'm unfortunately <laughs> I'm highly caffeinated. Um, so in general, especially when you have a small firm, um, there are two things pretty much throughout the day you have to do. Well, one thing you have to do and usually the other one you do often, you usually drink coffee at least two or three times a day, whether you want to or not, and you have to eat lunch. So let's just you know confess that those are the two things that we have to do. I am a huge fan of going to coffee with anyone, whether it's a sub consultant, whether it's an attorney, whether it's a broker, because there's a lot that can be learned business to business over a $3 cup of coffee. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, in terms of lunch, I will have lunch with any potential client. Um, and and I've, I've had to kind of modify that in recent years for people who do public work. Um, there are, in certain states, there are very large conflict of interest provisions and so Within those provisions, there are constraints around which around which uh, money can be spent. And I believe in certain parts of California, I don't think you can spend any more than five dollars, which is why the cup of coffee is usually a really you know good first start. But around lunch, I've always said never eat alone. Go with the client. Go with the sub consultant. Um, go with a business to business partner. And the idea is really again not to sell your firm but to understand where are opportunities, where are trends, where are things changing and trending, and where can your firm actually respond. This is especially true for firms that have less than 50 people because they tend to be a little bit more nimble in that regard. And so they need to take advantage of the fact that they're not a huge bureaucratic behemoth, that they can have a lunch or a coffee with a potential client and try and develop a relationship around what is their interest, what is their core business. Great. Let's anything else you want to add into the market that you just really feel needs to be needs to be said or stated. And then let's jump into the finances side. On the marketing side, gosh, there's so many things I want to tell people. Um, well, let's, let's I, I tell think, them. Let's tell them. If we don't get to finances, that's fine. This is number two. So let's, let's dive into it, Karen. We have you here. I, I think the most, the most important thing really and truly is I understand and appreciate the need to develop work. I understand the need and understand and appreciate the need to do a project. But the best business partners understand their client's core business. 
And so if I give you one piece of sage advice next to never eat alone, uh, it would be understand your client's core business, whether that's residential, whether that's um, mixed use retail, housing, whatever it has to be, understand all of those facets, not just from a policy perspective or a funding perspective, but from a time and timing perspective. All of those things will influence how and what they think about a project. Public-private partnerships have grown in California. And one of the biggest reasons they've grown is because the funding constraint for public agencies, in some cases for, for private institutions as well, has grown. And so out of that has come a different way about thinking about project work. In a public-private partnership, for example, the client, which previously, let's say, would have been a university, is no longer the client. The client is the development entity who has the money. So it's important to understand the business and the constraints because those constraints will inform how projects are designed and built and brought forward. That would be my, my most important sage piece mm. of wisdom. Well, I know you touched on that a little bit with your example about the, the school districts and understanding the other things that go into um, the mm -hmm. industry, not just the project. Do you have some examples or a story that you can tell us about how, what it really means to understand the business, the core business, just so our listeners can get a really concrete idea. Okay. I see that's what Karen's talking about here. When she says, understand the core business, I need to, I need to know this, this, and this, and this, this is what I'm looking for and listening for. Okay. So I'll, I'll give you an example of a, of a school. Um, this was a, a private institution and their problem, quite frankly, was they needed to build housing. They needed to build student housing, but they didn't, they're not a, a state state school, so there wasn't a possibility of them doing a, what's called a referendum, where they can basically tax themselves or the students can choose to tax themselves. And so there was a lot of push and pull around what I would consider what's called student life. They're, them kind of saying, look, we really need housing for our students, but we don't have the money in order to do it. What are we actually going to do? We have the land, but we don't have a whole lot more to offer other than the fact that we have the land. The institution, through its constraints, because it really kind of truly acknowledged that it no longer had the ability to finance something like a housing project, decided to go to a housing developer, a student housing developer. So now the cheese moved. If the architect had been chasing the university exclusively for the right and the opportunity to build student housing, they would have been chasing the wrong cheese because the cheese moved. The university decided, you know what, we can't do this. The best thing that we can do is enter into a public-private partnership with a third-party university housing developer and they're going to need to build this housing. We will enter into a ground lease with them for a certain period of years. In this case, it was a design, build, and operate um, mode. So the third-party housing developer had to not only hire the architect, they had to find the financing in order to make it work. There was a ground lease that came in in, in exchange for that. They had the opportunity to not only build it, so the the developer brought the architect and the contractor. They also had to bring the entity who was going to operate the student housing for the next, I think, I can't remember the terms of the actual lease, but it was a long-term lease and operation. And so in that analogy, the cheese moved. If, if the architect had only been looking at the client as the traditional, or the university as a traditional client, they would have missed the opportunity in the absence of not understanding the constraints, the true constraints, they would have missed the opportunity to understand that the cheese was going to move, and it did, to a third-party developer. I like that analogy, the cheese. <laughs> Got the cheese. There's actually a book. There's actually a very good book. I wish I could remember the author, but the, the name of the book is Who Moved the Cheese? Oh. And it's actually a book about and around marketing. And it really focuses on the idea that, that we all tend to focus really too narrowly on the cheese 
instead of who's actually moving it and where does it go and why. I'll email you afterwards. I have to find the the author. It's funny you mention that because within the past two weeks, this book came up also. I don't remember where I was really? talking with someone, but this, this title came up. Uh-huh. It's funny you mention that. Is it a new book or has it been around for a while? It's been out for about six or seven years, but it's kind of like um, the Good to Great books. It took a long time for our industry to actually find it. Um, in, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, as a business or as an industry, the design and construction industry is kind of slow to catch up to the, the fundamentals of business. Yes. So while other, while other industries making widgets, making iPhones, making Coke or Pepsi, whatever it happened to be, really understand the fundamental tenets of business and business management, marketing, knowing your client, knowing your demographic, our industry has kind of been slow to catch up. So the Who Moved the Cheese book and the Good to Great books, um, Jim Collins's books have been out in other industries for a very, very long period of time. We're, we're just a little bit slower in terms of being able to embody the wealth of information within these, within these tools and then trying to apply it. Yeah. What, what kind of changes are you seeing, Karen? Because it feels like you probably have your pulse on what's happening in different firms in different areas of the country, different market sectors, just from a macro level. How is, what is the industry? Do you have any prognostications? I know you're not a fortune teller, but if you had to, you know, where is the industry headed and what are some of the market forces that architects are going to be facing? Wow. Biggest market forces are still going to be driven by the economy. I think we really have to um, wrap our heads around the fact that this is a very different economy than it was post or pre to what, 2006. Mm -hmm. um, and so within that, Constra within that constraint, while the economy is better, um, I haven't seen firms jumping to add back their overhead. Um, they've been very, very slow um, to add back of house functions on a permanent basis. And I don't see, I actually see that as a long-term systemic change in the industry. I don't really see it going back to pre-2006, where we had lots and lots of people on the back of house. Um, in terms of other changes, um, I do continue to see public-private partnerships. I think they've been a little slower in the West than they have been in the South and in the Southeast. That model has been used for a very, very long time for toll roads and bridges and things like that in the South and the Southeast. I think in the on the West Coast, it's been a little bit slower to come on board, but nonetheless, we have seen it and it is making a, a pretty strong uh, face uh, in terms of that. Um, the, the one thing that I would say that has been encouraging is that I have seen more firms try and truly understand their demographic. Who is their client? Because all clients are not the same. I have a friend of mine who um, is a shoe designer for a very big tennis shoe company. And I said to her once, who is your demographic? And she looked at me with a perfectly straight face and said, 18 to 24 year olds, parents have a disposable income. They're in the $65,000 a year annual, uh, annual uh, salary range. She knew exactly who her demographic was. She knew that her buyer was an 18 to 24 year old, which basically meant they had no money, but their parents did. And in that constraint, that was who she was designing her shoe for. Now, fast forward, I can't honestly tell you that I can go into an architectural practice or an engineering practice unilaterally and, ha and say to them, tell me who your target buyer is. Tell me who your target client is. But they've gotten better. Um, in the last five years, I think largely because of the recession uh, and a lack of resources, people have had to become smarter about where they invest their time, where they invest their talent and their money. And so by default, they're taking a much more critical look at the go and the no-go. 
but where I think they have an opportunity to improve is really truly understanding who their client is. What is the makeup of that individual? And then finding the alignment between themselves as an organization and that target buyer. And it, it sounds very um, kind of simplistic because that's what is done in other, uh, in other industries. But in point of fact, if we applied it in design and construction, I think we would find much better client relationships. So you've talked about, in terms of the marketing, you've talked about really understanding the clients and you said you had a lot. Uh, there's just so many things you could talk about. Is there anything else in the in the marketing side of things that you just want to tell our listeners comes to mind? Leave your brochure at home. Send it later. Spend your time listening to your clients and to your potential clients and then modify what you send them based on what you hear. Don't bring something already pre-prepared with the assumption that you're going to sell them. They don't want to be sold anymore. The clients today, I, I think, are far more sophisticated than the ones of 10 or 15 years ago. They're not looking to be sold. They want to be engaged. They want to be listened to. They want someone to talk to them, to understand them, to be empathetic. Um, and if you can help them, great. And if you can't, that's fine too. But be less interested in trying to sell something and be more interested in trying to engage. That's profound. I just want to leave the silence there to kind of let that, that value bomb just drop there for a minute. Just give people a minute to think about that. Well, Karen, I think we'll have to leave the financial part of things for another conversation. However, oh, that's a bummer. I know. However, um, I would like to know what, what are you seeing the most competitive firms out there that you're looking at and you're seeing they're doing some pretty cool stuff and they got their act together. Are there a few key things or commonalities that they have? And if so, what are they? The firms that are doing well talk a lot. They talk a lot amongst themselves and not just up and not just about design. I think some of the most competitive firms that I've seen, the ones that are truly, I am truly impressed with, um, are ones that are talking to their junior level staff about the business, that are getting them to understand not just profit and loss, um, but getting them to understand and engage around the ideas of business. Um, and that has been a significant, significant change in the last probably three to five years more than anything. There are a lot more conversations around um, why profits matter, what we do with profit, how we invest in the firm, why investment is necessary. Investment isn't always in the form of greater salary, it might be in the investment of software and why that makes us more competitive as an organization, having that level of dialogue. What I still continue to be amazed with is the number of firms that are scared to share the numbers. The, the, the fear is if I, if I tell too much, then they're going to take my information and do something with it. Um, honestly, um, employees to a certain extent within a firm are kind of like your children. You have to tell them enough so that they can make an informed decision. Um, and, and that informed decision, particularly in a competitive market the way, the, like the one that we're in right now, I think it's important that people have enough information that they want to stay, that they want to, want to and see themselves invested in your practice. Um, and not just financially, but in its own long-term success, growth, and development. So you have to communicate enough to give them that sense of security. Otherwise, they'll leave. And that's unfortunate. So the more competitive firms communicate extremely well, and they communicate often. And not, like I said, not just around the tenets of great, of great design. Mm. Well, Karen, I, and now I feel guilty about leaving our, our listeners without some, some juicy nuggets in the area of finance. Do you, do you have? <laughs> you just have to come back and have me back again or something. You want to come back on the show? I would love to. All right. Well, Karen, it's 
we've been speaking with Karen Compton today. She's the principal of A3K Consulting, and she helps small firms in the AEC spaces thrive and succeed. So, Karen, thank you for being on the Business of Architecture. Thank you so much. I hope you'll have me back. We will. Have you thought about starting your own practice, or are you looking to take your practice to the next level? If so, I wanted to let you know that free registration for the 2016 Architecture Business Plan Competition opens on December 1st, 2015. Start your planning process now and enter for a chance to win a grand prize of $10,000. Five finalists will be flown to Philadelphia to present their full plans to four industry-leading jurors. Travel and lodging are provided. So this is a -a one-of-a-kind competition. It's open to all licensed architects in the United States and Canada who are planning to start a new firm within one year or currently own a firm that is less than 10 years old. Visit archbusinessplan.com to learn more. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.